please join me in welcoming our guest today, Nadira Karmai. Um, and some of you kind of don't look like the cookie cutter West Michigan folk out here. And you've probably been asked that question that's on the screen, what are you? With a show of hands, how many people have actually asked that question to somebody? Don't feel embarrassed. What are you? Okay, and um, how many of you have been asked that question? Literally, someone has came up to you, maybe in mid-conversation or interrupted your conversation and said, what are you? Now, I am West Michigan native, born, raised. I'm from Rockford, Michigan. So I understand that that question typically means, where are you from? I mean, and some of you might be asking that right now. Is she Indian? Is she black? She Hawaiian, I've gotten Hawaiian a ton of times. And no, the answer, I'm, I'm, I'm not any of those things. I'm Guyanese, and uh, I know you guys are art and design students, but anyone wanna take a stab at where Guyana is? Anyone? You, you can't be older than 30 to answer that because Guyana is, um, is where we get, you know, if, if you guys ever have ever heard the term, don't drink the Kool-Aid, we're gonna give you a little history lesson. Who's heard that? Don't drink the Kool-Aid. <laughs> It comes from Guyana, South America, because crazy dude way back in the day named Jim Jones actually took some people because of discrimination and craziness. He took these people to Guyana, um, this chosen prophet land, gave them the Kool-Aid. They drank it, and uh, they all they had a mass self-suicide. Um, it was crazy. So that's a little backstory to why Guyana is so famous. Don't drink the Kool-Aid. I'm Guyanese. Uh, that's the long story of it. I'm of East Indian descent, and I've been asked a thousand times, what are you? And let me go to uh, carry on that I am feeling like the epitome of minority. So I'm a woman in the media industry. You can see there's a camera guy right there, like Deborah mentioned. I used to work for Fox 17, and, and most of my colleagues were men. So I'm a woman in the media industry. I'm gay, but as you can see the cross, I... I'm Christian, I practice of Christian faith, and look at all those great white people there. Man, I'm brown and I'm living in West Michigan, growing up in Rockford. I don't know where you guys geographically are from, if you're from Western Michigan, or maybe you're from the east side of the state, or you're out of state, but Rockford, man, there's a lot of people that look like that. You know, thumbs up, yes, white, middle to upper class. How do you think I felt? How do you think I felt living in Rockford with all of these, you know, triple threat. Man, I'm a woman, I'm gay, and I don't re really even fit in. So I want to tell you guys a little bit more about myself uh, beyond the whole personality, uh, appearance part of me, um, really who I am. So my coming out story, I knew at about age 10 that I was different. Something really resonated me in about that uh, fourth, fifth grade years where people are making cootie catchers for boys and I'm sitting here saying I kind of want to make a cootie catcher for my girlfriends and I want to stay inside and you know hang out with with the girls because I kind of like girls but I don't understand why this is kind of weird so I knew at such a young age that something was different I didn't know what homosexuality was but I could tell something doesn't add up something is a little a little weird maybe Right? But I was raised in a Christian home that's not as, as crazy as Westboro Baptist Christian, really, really crazy devout, but devout enough where we would go to church every Sunday and every Wednesday. You guys familiar with, with the um, Christian Reformed Church where that's, that's what their faith is? They, they're really into that. They go to church every Sunday and Wednesday, sometimes in between Saturday night services. And in that church, and in church culture, we are taught that being gay and being anything other than straight and having a husband and bearing children and taking care for them was sinful, right? So as a child learning all of this and hearing this and, and being told that if you don't live this way, if you choose to live a different way, in that, that's not... Uh, you know, assimilated with the culture of Christian denomination, then that's wrong. So my parents, they immigrated from Guyana, South America, when they were about 19, 20 years old. 
How many of 19, 20 year old people are in here? You guys are a little bit older? Nope, you're in 19, 20? Okay, so think about that. You moved to a different country and you learn all about their culture through the vehicle that is a church. And let me pause for a second. I'm not, I, I don't want you to get carried away and think, I don't want to listen to any church bashing because trust me, I'm a full advocate for spiritual journeys. And this is just, I'm sharing you my perspective on the Christian faith and uh, the discrimination that I have felt and was developed between my parents, the Christian faith, and my coming out story, okay? So trust me, I'm a big fan of Jesus, Buddha, all the other deities, I'm all for it, but I'm just gonna share you my personal story, all right? Gotta put that out there so I'm not getting any uh, you know, hate mail after this. So um, my parents learned about American culture through, like I said, the vehicle that is the church. Um, they were taught gender roles, they were taught the, the purpose of a woman and what her roles were and how to act as American people. All right, so through their knowledge of what Christians are and what Americans are, that was passed down to me. So you can imagine a small little 10-year-old child wondering, something's kind of different with me, and then, man, but this isn't okay because from what I've learned in church, this is wrong, right? So I really had a hard time, um, you know, reconciling my faith and differences in between all of this. My parents' culture, aside from their faith, uh, Indian culture, Guyanese culture, uh, really focuses that the woman takes care of the man. So the woman takes care of the man in the kitchen, in the bedroom, and with her children. So I was taught that. I was taught that this is how you should be and you shouldn't be anything different. I have two older brothers, they could be like my dad and I should be just like my mom. It was really, really ingrained in me. So when I came out, it was a surprise to them. How could you come out? We've been teaching you how to live for years and years. It's been ingrained in you that this is what a woman's role is, that she cooks in the kitchen, that she bears children, that she stands by her man, behind her man, right? So I'm so gay that I actually had to come out twice. Once when I was 20 years old, I was a sophomore <laughs> in college, and my parents didn't like it. They were, you know, they were paying for school. I don't know how many of you guys are lucky that your parents help you out financially, but they said, look, you know that this lifestyle is wrong. We're gonna put you back in the closet or else we're not gonna pay for school. So I wrestled with that and I said, man, you know, I'm, I'm at Grand Valley State University. I'm learning about individuality and what culture is and the LGBT community. And I thought that this is something that they would appreciate. I'm being empowered. I'm finding myself. And of course, I'm met with backlash because of what they have learned coming from Guyana to America through the vehicle that was the church, right? So they were learned how to behave, what to think, what ideals were from the church. So I came out again after college, and this time I was a little bit more better prepared. I was financially stable, um, I knew who I was, and I embraced the fact that I was gay. I wasn't ashamed about it anymore. I didn't see it as something that was weird as I once did when I was 10. You know, I really, I struggled. I went through a journey and I said, this is who I am and I'm proud of it, and mom and dad, we've, we've gotta have a conversation about this. We can go on and on about, you know, steering a conversation with your parents and, and how to go through coming out, but my personal journey has always been met with oppression. There's been some church people that don't talk to me anymore. My parents sometimes, we still to this day, man, I've been out for six years and they still um, will have some pretty grave conversations with me. In fact, this past December, I, um, I was hanging out with them in New York City. That's where my parents first migrated. And they, uh, they, they had this, this idea of, we want to exercise the gay out of our daughter. I mean, this is how, I really want you guys to understand how much an idea can really breed fear. Okay, they were taught by a group of people who happened to be Christian that being gay is not okay, it is a sin. Her salvation is damned, 
Okay, so this fear learned by a culture, whatever, you know, this happened just to be a Christian culture, okay, I'm not, again, I'm not dogging on Christians, but, so they had this fear that she's going to go to hell, so let's exercise a gay at her. I had no idea. Hanging out with my family in New York City, ready to meet, you know, auntie, uncle. I mean, I don't know how many of you have uh, aunts and uncles that really aren't bloodline your aunts and uncles, but that's what you call them anyway because it's a respect issue. And so I'm like, yeah, I'm so excited to eat crazy Indian food that's really spicy and just relax with my family, right? But boom, all of a sudden, I had eight hands, eight sets of hands laid on me trying to exercise me. I'm like 25 years old at this point saying, what the hell? Are you serious? You're really trying to lay hands on me. But you know what? That's the fear. That's the fear that they had. And some people, we're going to go beyond just talking about gays and lesbians. Some people, when they don't know what to do, they're met with fear, or they're met with hate, or they're met with ignorance. You know, they, they don't understand what are you. That's the question that we first asked um, when I started this presentation. What are you? And when people don't understand that, sometimes they do crazy things. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. So we have some terms up here that you guys have probably been already reading about. Lipstick lesbian. The LGBTQ, the LGBT community sometimes even likes to make their own labels and slang and phrases. This definition, I mean, because there really isn't a definition, is from Urban Dictionary. Can you guys read that? It's, they generally enjoy fashion, flowers, perfume, sex in the city, lingerie, lipstick, of course. I hate lipstick. And passionate sex with other women. All right, I'm not a lipstick lesbian, but I wanted to throw that out there because I want to see how many of you are familiar with this term or know some other terms of, of gay and lesbian people. Yes, shout, shout one out. What's another term? Butch. Bears. bears. Yep, for, for the gay guys, bears. Go ahead. Femme. Femme. I mean, we construct them. Boy girls. Boy girls, yep. So this whole presentation that I'm trying to communicate to you guys is fear sometimes can create containers like lipstick lesbian. I mean, sometimes in a stereotypical fashion, it helps communicate and identify people, but in this way, it's not so derogatory or discriminatory, and we're going to talk about some words that are derogatory and discriminatory, but this is an example where we're just kind of getting into it. Uh, pants or pumps, I've, asked, I've been asked that so many times, so who wears the pants in your relationship? My girlfriend's sitting right back here. You can ask her the same question, and she'll tell you, look, we both share pants and pumps relationships. There's no boy in the relationship. That's why we're gay, for Pete's sake. I take out the trash. I kill the spiders. Don't boys usually do that? Are, are, you know, who has a boyfriend and, and is in a heterosexual relationship? Doesn't your boyfriend do that? No, come on, people. We're beyond that, right? So we both wear the pants and the pumps. Masculinity, this definition, having qualities or appearance traditionally associated with men, especially strength and aggressiveness. I played lacrosse at Grand Valley. That's a pretty aggressive on-contact sport. And physically, I'm pretty sure I'm not a man. So why did we as society have to include men in that definition of masculinity? Why did we? You know, this is all about social construct and constructive words and, uh, and phrases here. So to break all of this down, I found this really cool little dude, the genderbred person. You guys heard of the gingerbread man? Well, this is my buddy, the genderbred person. You can go ahead and take a look at it. So he's going to help me. Well, I shouldn't say he. The person is going to help me break down some definitions, all right? So, gender identity, you can see the spectrum right here, all right? It's who you think you are. It's about how you internally see yourself and how you believe that you fit the society's role of what a man, you can see that on the right, and what a woman is. So we have man, woman, and in the middle we have gender queer. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that term, but gender queer is someone who maybe they don't believe their identity fits with a man or a woman. It's somewhere in the middle of that spectrum. So, just like I said in the beginning of my presentation that 
my parents learned how people, what a woman's role is through the church, that's constructed through a culture. This is too. Gender is socially constructed. We learn this from our peers. It is passed down to us. Gender expression. On the left, we have feminine. On the right, we have masculine. And in the middle, we have androgynous. It's sort of a new term, but people have been accepting it more and more. This is how you showcase your gender through the ways you act, dress, and behave. People interpret gender expression based on traditional gender roles. So when I wear my skinny tie, and I'm wearing loafers, and I have my hair pulled back in a ponytail, sometimes my mom hates it, and she's like, Nadira, why don't you wear a dress? You need to look more girly. I don't <laughs> want to wear a dress, and I don't want to look more girly. All right, sometimes I like to dress what society says kind of looks more like a boy. That's my gender expression. All right? Is everyone kind of following along here? Pretty cut and dry? And then we've got biological sex. This is known to be chromosomes, hormones, basically what you are born with and what is between your legs. It's generally uniform and unified across the globe. On the left, we have female. On the right, we have male. And right here in the middle, we have intersex. Now you might be asking, how often does intersex births happen? Well, from the Intersex Association of North America, it's actually, this is a pretty surprising st statistic, one in 100 births come out to be neither directly male or directly female. So, it's pretty interesting because we've already deduced from this ginger, gender-bred person that for so long it's either on the left or on the right, right? And uh, there's only two options, so what happens to people who are intersex? More on that a little bit later. Sexual orientation, you guys are familiar with LGBT, there are other uh, adjectives to that, X, Y, Z, Q, T, A, I mean the list can go on, um, and we'll talk more about LGBT and Q. Um, one more term I want to talk about is gender binary. It really shows how we do gender. On the gender-bred person, you saw feminine, masculine. This is the two containers that society has split people up to be. So this is socially constructed. It's the two options that gender provides. You're born with a penis, so you're male, you're he, you play football, you're tough. That last part, you play football, you're tough. That is socially constructed. That's one of two options that you can be or you're born with a vagina, so you're female, you're her, you excel at baking and decorating, and you're gentle, right? So look at how many people, different people we have in the room. This is a pretty diverse classroom, and, I, and I'm impressed because even at GVSU, I didn't have this much diversity, honestly. Even, even just appearance-based, I didn't have this much diversity. At Rockford, everyone looked alike, and everyone fit into one of two gender binary. They either fit into feminine or masculine. They were either a boy or a girl. It wasn't if and or buts about it. All right, so two options for all the people in the world. There's like seven plus billion people in the world and we only have two options? I thought this was America. You could have it your way. How is there only two options for this? We're going to see how this, uh, this plays out even more in this little silly commercial. How do I entertain a packed house? With my Electrolux appliances. Now I can cook the roast for the dinner party and the mac and cheese for the sleepover. Simmer the chocolate sauce, toss Jack his toy, serve the gummy bears, then the apple juice at the perfect temperature, be the charming co-host, clean the stemware perfectly, and end the night looking for monsters under the bed. With wave touch controls and an induction hybrid cooktop that boils water in 90 seconds, you can be even more amazing. By the way, I want one of these because Electrolux seems like it's really freaking cool. Um, but come on, Kelly Ripa, we know that you have your own show and that you, you, know, in, you endorse Electrolux, but this, this is more than that. 
Because how many moms, stay at home moms, are out there, or part time moms or full time moms are out there, and they're being fed messages like this? Again, anthropologists, sociologists, feminists, we've all learned that this is socially constructed. So if we're always told that, and if we know, yeah, I get the point, it's socially constructed, then why does it happen? Why does it still happen that people come up to you and ask you, what are you? And then you feel like shit because you're saying, don't they know this by now? Haven't this been, hasn't this been shoved down our throats that, that people can be more than just a stay-at-home mom who's a breadwinner and also takes care of her kids and can cook and clean and have everything perfect like Kelly? If we know it, then why is it still happening? That's really the reason why I'm here. It's not to tell you my story or tell Kelly's story or show you a bunch of pictures about a gingerbread, genderbread person. It's to really say, what's going on here? Why are we in a room where we know all of this information and this keeps happening? You, know, you guys are especially interesting because you're in art and design and there's so many different facets. You know, my specialty was broadcast journalism and video, and there's just so many different containers and labels and ways to produce a video. And that's kind of how people are too. There's so many different ways to talk to people, to find out who they are, to learn from them, but we're only trying to fit them into two boxes. Doesn't that kind of seem stupid, guys? I mean, doesn't that, that seem like it, it doesn't make sense at all? So what happens when people don't look pretty which is another socially constructed term like Kelly Ripa. She is pretty. Um, what, what happens to people who look like, like this? They don't have the blonde hair. They don't have an Electrolux. They probably, you know, they, whether they can afford it or not, they don't look like her because they don't want to. They're beautiful in their own way. This is a really cool photo montage. You guys got to go to Huffington Post and look up butch women. Um, just go ahead, go online, literally go on to Huffington Post and, and there's a really cool article and op-ed piece about these women and how they identify as butch uh, women and, and they appreciate their gender bending personalities and personas. Um, so what happens? In West Michigan, when we're met with people that look like this, in West Michigan, we're known, from my perspective, to all kind of look alike, to all be Dutch CRC people who kind of are like Kelly Ripa. In bigger cities, all these women are from the San Diego area. They, they see each other like this. In West Michigan, we don't have the diversity where people, there's a lot of population that looks like that. So what about people who look like this? Well, we're gonna talk about queer. Queer is known as a word that's derogatory. It's similar to the N-word for most people. Not anymore. Queer is being reclaimed. So let me give you a history on what queer is and, and what these photos mean. Back in the day, there was something called the Stonewall Riots. And in the 60s and in the 70s, in a place called the Stonewall Inn in New York City, the LGBT people were brutalized, like spontaneous brutal attacks. You can see the police taking out these people um, just because they were gay. And they would use that weird queer, so, so hateful. And people stopped using it as a way to be proud of themselves. But now it's changing in the academics and theories, um, in conversation with the LGBT community themselves, they use queer positively. Uh, as an umbrella term. So they use it as a way to say, I'm, I, you know what, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna label myself. I'm labeling myself, but I'm not gonna label myself. I don't fit into the L, G, B, or T, I'm queer. And you might say, hey Nadira, do you, you know, do I identify as queer? That's not my personal preference. I usually just say, hey, I'm gay. Um, I know that sometimes I like to dress masculine, and there are people like that, like my good friend Emily, who I actually wrote about her for Women's Lifestyle um, in that uh, article, The Comeback of Queer. She is born a female. She likes the pronouns she, her, hers. Um, and she identifies as queer because she looks a little bit different. She doesn't fit that mold of what a female should look like what she should look like, right? Um, and she likes that, so it's an umbrella term. It includes anyone who feels somehow outside the societal norms. I interviewed 
a really smart lady at GVSU, Dr. Laurel Westbrook. She's done a ton of research on binary systems, on queerism, on queer theories. And uh, I really like the quote that she said, uh, being queer means having a commitment to question categories and binaries. So it's a really good way to say, I don't fit any of this. Remember the gender, ber uh, the gender person, broad person we saw in the middle. We saw intersex, we saw androgyny. That's similar to what people will, uh, will claim as queer. It's a fluid label. It's a, it's a fluid label that's opposed to a solid label. It's one that uh, requires to acknowledge that we're different without specifying exactly who we are. I know this might be a lot to take in. We're going to have Q&A in a minute. But um, I wanted to give you a, a broad overview of what queer is before we jump into one last term for you guys, um, and that is trans. Good evening. They are the words that any parent would want to hear about their daughter. She is such a remarkable little girl. For a girl named Jazz, the word remarkable doesn't begin to cover it. At just 11 years old, she has taken what most children and their families would regard as a terrible secret and brought it smashing into the open. She is the brave and beautiful new face of a child born in the wrong body. Describe jazz to us. Vibrant, happy, full of life, self-confident, beautiful, glowing. Feminine? So feminine. She wears pink cleats on the soccer field. Do you like my new bra? And padded bras. She not only dreams of mermaids, she swims like one. If you didn't know it, would you believe this 11-year-old girl was biologically a boy? Let's get this straight, Jazz. Are you a boy or a girl? I am definitely a girl. Like, that's all I consider myself as. I'm sorry, I know I never do anything with my hair, but... Jazz is transgender, a boy living as a girl. I have a girl brain and a boy body. Hi. When we first met Jazz in 2007, she was only six years old, and one of the youngest documented cases of an early transition from male to female. We'll say things like, God made you special, because there aren't very many little girls out there that have a penis. At age five, her parents, Jeanette and Greg, made an extraordinary... You just go on YouTube and, and look up transgender at 11, listening to jazz. Jazz has a really inspiring story. I really love it and appreciate it because, you know, this is a great example, but this is just one of many examples. Not all parents can identify and understand that their child is different and will accept what they are hearing from their child. Mom, I'm different. Something's wrong. I feel like I'm born in the wrong body. Not all parents can accept that and appreciate that and help their child wrestle and, and change and figure out what that really means. You know, I also like this example because a lot of us can, can probably think in our personal lives of someone who's kind of like Jazz. We probably all know a little kid who's vibrant and full of life. Uh, but what about people who, you know, like I mentioned before, their parents don't allow them to change. Their parents don't want to hear their complaints. Mom, I feel like I'm trapped in a different body. Those people, some of them, end up wrestling really bad later in life. Some of them are actually my friends. Um, in one of my articles from Women's Lifestyle, um, the T and transphobia, I talked to one of my friends, Jenna, who, um, you know, I wasn't given permission to use any photos, but during her transition later in life, she endured a lot of discrimination, just based on appearances, just based on the fact that she couldn't have it like Jazz, where her parents said, okay, Jenna, we understand, you know, you were born as a man, but now you want to become a woman. She had to bear that on her own. That's a pretty big thing to do. It's already a pretty big deal to come out and say, I like someone who is the same sex, but now to say, I don't think my body really matches who I am, my gender identity is different from my biological sex. What happens with those people? When people don't fit into the two containers we've constructed and they don't look like society's typical man or woman, that's when we get confused. 
You know, confusion's okay. I've been confused. I've asked people before, what are you? What pronouns do you want me to use? Can I call you a guy or girl? Does it matter? But you guys know that, right? You know how to navigate through it. And if you don't know how to navigate through it, my friend like Jenna Lewis um, says, you know what? Just ask. I want to get to know you a little bit better. Can I ask you a question about your gender identity? Don't keep guessing. I'm, you know, I'm, I've made stupid mistakes where I kept guessing too. And I'm like, hey man, hey dude. And it's like, yeah, she's a she. Don't be, don't be a stupid person like that. So you're armed with this knowledge. You know that it's okay to ask. You know that people would prefer that you ask, just like I prefer when people pronounce my name correctly. It's Nadira Carmi, not Nadira whatever, right? We all, we all want to be called the proper terms, right? That's what I'm getting at. So don't be afraid to ask them, what would you prefer to be called? So confusion's okay, but when is confusion bad? Is when you become an asshole and decide to say, you know what, I don't like this. I don't, I don't understand what she is. Is that a he or a she? And I'm not comfortable with that. I'm not comfortable with them sitting across from me or part of my group project in class. I'm not comfortable with them being at my workplace. In that article that I mentioned with Women's Lifestyle, Jenna has told me that she, is discrim she has been discriminated against in the workplace many times, being pulled over, and you have to hand that police officer your license, and you see a picture of a boy, but he's met with, in person, a woman, kind of. Right? That's when confusion becomes ignorance because you're not accepting the fact that people are more than two containers. All right? So that's when, that's when things start to get into the lines of discrimination. So what can we do? What can we do about this? Acknowledging different gender and sexual identities helps increase Equality, freedom, health, happiness. Existing categories, existing categories like male, female, lipstick lesbian, dyke, butch, bear, whatever. Those kind of things perpetuate inequality. There's a notion that straight is more valuable than gay. There's tons of notions that the stereotypical cookie cutter CRC, Jesus waving hands Christian is better than someone who is of color and who doesn't practice Christian faith. Look how this is happening with marriage equality. Everyone knows what happened a couple of weeks ago that the judge overruled the ban that marriage is unconstitutional. Well, some people jumped at that idea and said, I'm gonna get married. One woman did. One woman in Detroit, CNN just reported on this a couple of days ago. She got married to her partner a couple days later, she was brutally attacked. Someone saw her on the news and said, you're a faggot, I'm gonna attack you. Right, so this happens all the time. It's all because of what? Containers, binaries, labels? No wonder people wanna use the word queer, geez. But a way to get involved and to make sure that this doesn't happen is coming to events like these is going to, I don't know if you guys at, here at Kendall have an LGBT allies and advocates program. I'm sure you do. This seems to be a pretty progressive school. Grand Valley State University has one, you know, and it's great that you even have one if you do, but collaborate. Think about having a collaboration between students of this sort of group and, and see what, what are we missing? We, you know, you can't, you can't help but think that discrimination probably happens more than you realize in the classroom. I mean, I felt it before. I felt it when I was at Rockford High School and I was discriminated because I was just a different color. How do you think people feel about being discriminated against because they look differently? Isn't it asking someone, hey, can I ask you, what pronouns would you like me to use? Isn't that a lot better than leaving someone out? We've all been there before. We've all felt like an outcast. So that's another way I encourage you guys to do is get involved with your groups, even maybe reach out to other universities, LGBT programs, because there's ways that they can help bridge that gap and say, this is, this is, these are some areas where you might need some strength. The network, that's a really great resource. It's uh, in East Town, a really cool little brick and mortar spot where they have tons of resources on video, 
um, books, uh, lots of events and volunteer programs. Um, they even have um, a resource called PFLAG, but it's based out in Holland. Um, you're gonna have to drive a little bit, but and that's, that's for parents, friends, and families of gays and lesbians. So maybe your parents are struggling with what are queer people, what's the LGBT people. That's a really good resource for them to go out there, go onto the lakeshore, meet with a, uh, a group of people who at once they struggled with you know, what is this whole gay movement about? I don't want to feel like I'm hating on my kid anymore. Um, that's a resource for them. And then Until Love is Equal, I'm a part of that organization too. Really cool grassroots organization here in Grand Rapids where um, they do a lot of events and they just talk about equality. How can my life be just as equal as yours? What can we do to strengthen that right here in Grand Rapids? So. Guys, thank you for your time and for, uh, for letting me talk to you a little bit about something that's different. Um, I'm open to any questions, and uh, thank you again.